Morning, everybody. My name is Phil. I work for Domain. And today, uh, just a disclaimer, uh, is anybody here a distributed systems expert? Uh, good, because I'm, I'm not a distributed systems expert either. I'm just a dev. Uh, a lot of this talk is really going to talk about all the things that we've done with ACA.NET and Actor Systems in general, and all the mistakes that we've made, and some of the mistakes that you could avoid by learning some of the lessons that we actually did. So just a quick overview. Uh, a couple of years ago, what happened was in domain, we had a big, big problem. And the problem was that like a lot of online real estate websites, even our competitors, we needed something called Clickstream Analytics. Is everybody here familiar with Google Analytics? OK, so some of you are. For those of you that aren't, Clickstream Analytics is this, it's really just the art of understanding what your users do on your website so that you could collect this data and then process it later and be able to create better products based on what people actually do. So instead of having a product team that would say, well, we think this is what people like, you actually use real data and you collect real data to build better products. But about two years ago in Domain, we had a serious problem. And the biggest problem that we had was that not only we, were we collecting the wrong data, we were actually losing events as part of this clickstream process. So when I sat down, and like any other dev with a new tool, and I was playing around with ACA.NET, I said, is there a better way to do this? Uh, and when we looked at this problem, there's a few things that we ran into. Uh, and the first thing is that the old system was running on a SQL Server database, and it had quite a bit of uh, triggers that would fire every time we wrote an event. And if it would kick uh, every time we get an event, what would happen is it would completely reject it if it violated any of the referential con constraints which is horrible when you're trying to collect everything. Uh, secondly, this, this was running on SQL Server reporting services. So that's fine back in, say, 2005 when the original system was put together. But this is 2017. It doesn't make sense to be running something like this when we were scaling up to millions of users and we needed to collect this stuff and be able to analyze it as fast as it comes in. So today, I'm really going to talk about how we put a system like this together. Um, and these are the things that you would expect out of a modern day uh, real-time reactive system. But I'll go over the, the points just to give you an idea of what we're going to go over. So the first thing is really around reliability. That means that when we collect data about all our users, we should have, at least within a reasonable amount of margin, the ability to say that we won't lose anything. Of course, it's not perfect, but we want to cl come as close to perfect as possible. The second part is really traceability. So when we have events that come in, and we want to do uh, real-time aggregations based on what streams in, and somebody comes to us, like say an agent says, well, how do you know that these numbers are correct? We have to be able to, to look into the events that we've collected and say, here's event one, two, and three. This is why you have three click events. Um, and that's important because when you're, on, when you're in a real estate ba a business and you're in the ad agency, you have to be able to, to sell these ads and say, yes, we get this much traffic. But the business is effectively useless if you can't provide traceable and reliable numbers. Uh, the third bit, which is fairly self-explanatory, is it needs to come in as fast, uh, sorry, it needs to compute as fast as it comes in. Uh, given that we're, most of us are running within the cloud, it's very easy to spin up another box and add that capacity. But as you'll see during the course of this talk, it cap really messes things up. And I'll talk about how we got around that. Uh, the other bit is accuracy. So obviously, we need to be able to add all those three things together. And we need to be able to recompute in case of uh, any errors. 
But as I mentioned before, when it's OK running on a single box. In fact, you have no uh, consistency problems running on a single box. The problem is that no matter how much you, how many instances you get in AWS where you get a super box, it's not, you still run into cap. You still run into the problem of that, what if that machine goes away and then you're screwed. So we really had to think about this. I mean, two years ago, domain moved onto AWS. We had all of a sudden this capacity to add more and more machines. And this is more of a plug for some of the other talks we've done in Domain, though. But we, the, we, what we did was we put together something called the Robot Army, which was a combination of Octopus Deploy and AWS. And it was this amazing tool that would allow us to provision machines at will with a, basically a push of a button. So there I was, 2015, saying that, hey, this looks pretty cool. I started playing around with ACA.NET, and I wanted to run this on multiple boxes. And it seemed like a good idea. I mean, you've got a, a few different actor systems that you can play around with. Of course, there's ACA.NET, there's Orleans, and if you want to go with the JVM, uh, that's fine too. And there's also ProtoActor if you want to go with something a bit more lightweight. Um, but at the time, it seemed, for me, I, I'm a very curious person, so I started tinkering around with ACA.NET. And I said, well, hey, we've got this job that takes several hours to run. What if I were to take every single that job and divide it into 86,400 smaller batch jobs or made it one job per second? So the idea is instead of just letting it sit there like any other batch job you would run in any other uh, shop, we could process it as fast as it comes in. And in theory, that's great. It, it's, it's easy to throw more actor systems into the mix and hope that everything's fine. But the biggest stumbling block that we had was managing state. When you have events streaming in at once, how do you guarantee that you're computing the right numbers? How do you guarantee that you don't lose anything? Uh, that was the hardest thing for us because we tried so many different approaches. We even tried using just uh, Postgres. And we thought, hey, you know, maybe it's just because we had bad schema. And, and it turns out that when we did it in Postgres, it would take an entire week to process something that we were able to do with just the actor systems that we had. But the trick here is we need to be able to manage state in such a way that you don't lose that consistency, or at least in our case, the consistency what the consistency window was in one day. Uh, if we sped it up for a little bit faster than just one day, the agents would have loved us. And, and that's what happened. But I'd like to say that everything went perfect. But a lot of the things I'm going to be talking about, like the theory, are things that we didn't necessarily look, know when we did it. These were things that we learned only as an afterthought. I, I was quite surprised that a lot of the stuff that we did, that we learned, was, was stuff that was already out there in different talks and whatnot. But I'm going to go over some of the things that you might already know, uh, just for a refresher. So first thing is with strong eventual consistency, it's this idea that as long as you have all the pieces and as long as you had an algorithm to be able to take all those pieces and put them together, uh, you can reach consistency and the order doesn't matter. Uh, the other bit about this one is there's also a weak eventual consistency where the order does matter, but you do still have that same window to reach consistency like, like what we did. So for example, we'd have events coming in uh, every second, but we had till the end of the day to actually process it. So if we're talking about um, strong eventual consistency, as long as we had all the pieces and we were able to process it, we did it in such a way that it didn't really matter what the order was as long as we came up with the right totals. Another way to explain this is what I like to call the IKEA analogy. So if you've ever assembled furniture from IKEA, the way I always like to explain it is how are you able to walk into IKEA, buy the same per, uh, piece of furniture as somebody else without talking to that other person, 
as long as you both have the same set of instructions, for the most part, you should be, at the end of the day, when you're done assembling it, you should come to roughly the same piece of furniture, depending how good you are with assembling things. And in that sense, it's pretty close to strong eventual consistency. Now, somebody uh, on a previous talk told me that, yeah, it, IKEA pieces are not all the same, and that's true. But in, in this case, when you're working with an enterprise system, there's a certain way you can reduce all your events down to something that where the order doesn't matter. And I'll get to that. So in hindsight, what we were actually doing is something called conflict-free replicated data types. So the title of this talk is Effective Eventual Consistency. And I know I, uh, some purists will say, you can't really cheat cap, uh, but you can sidestep it. And it seems complex, but it's actually not. Uh, and part of the reason why we needed to have strong eventual consistency is we knew that we, as a business, we couldn't afford to lose any data. But data loss is something that will happen, and you have to take the steps in order to prevent that from happening. And this is one of those things that we learned in hindsight, and it did help us uh, recover some w from some failures that happened last year. So does everybody ha remember the AWS outage in Sydney? Yeah, we were hit with that too, and, and this, this is the one that saved us. So uh, just a refresher, cap theorem, consistency, availability, partitioning, pick only two at once. Consistency meaning that everybody has the same view of the data at the same time. Partitioning means that if you have multiple nodes in a system, you could survive uh, multiple node outages without losing anything. Availability is just um, knowing whether or not a operation is successful depending on, oh, it's knowing whether or not it was successful right away, actually. The problem with this one is, as you can see here, there's different types of uh, storage providers that are, have their strengths with this one. In our case, we could sacrifice consistency because we didn't need things uh, computed uh, right away. At least we, we could wait until the end of the day to have everything consistent. And that gave us a bit more flexibility. So for CRDTs, it seems a bit weird. How, how do we sidestep the cap theorem in this case? So as I mentioned, you could only pick two. So if you look at this, you've got partitioning. Where we picked partitioning and availability, but how do we get consistency? So the trick here is that, number one, even though the data can only be two, pick two parts of the cap theorem, our merge algorithm is 100% consistent. That means all the nodes have exactly the same merge algorithm. The same, this, at the second, the second part of this is that CRDTs ensure partition tolerance because we make copies of every single thing that comes into the network. So every single node that we have has copies of all the data that streams in. So if you, you take out a node, it doesn't really affect the rest of the cluster, for example. Uh, at the same time, we do get that availability because since you have the copy of the data and you were to run operations over, the, over what you have, you could tell immediately whether or not you're successful depending on what you decide to do. Uh, for CRDTs in general, there's three operations. Um, for us, we only implemented two of them. So we implemented only the query and the merge operation. Now you're probably wondering what, why did we skip the update? And, and the simple reason is that we chose to be immutable. So we wanted to event source this so that we never have to worry about tracking deletes. So if you do a bit of research with CRDTs, there's different types of CRDTs that say um, you can track what's been deleted. Uh, these Typically, these CRDTs are the ones that you'd see in Google Docs. So if you ever edited more than one document at once and somebody else was editing it at the same time, what it would do is merge your deletes with their deletes and come up with a consistent state right away. In our case, we didn't need to do that. And it simplifies the CRDTs so that we just assume that the data set keeps growing and growing and growing and growing. And 
within a reasonable window, we do delete uh, CRDDs for the sake of just saving storage, but effectively for the sake of the business, uh, it just grows on and on and on forever. Uh, so as I mentioned, the first operation is querying. This is getting the state. Um, this is, by the way, this is not a, it doesn't have to be a service. It's more of a pattern. Uh, a lot of the stuff that we did with, um, with what we put together was around making sure that we implement these two operations. So there's query, and then the next one is the merge operation. So the merge operation seems a bit scary because it's, it seems like magic because what, how do I actually do something that maintains consistency? And there's three things that you basically need to be able to do with the merge operation. So commutative meaning order doesn't matter, associative meaning that the grouping doesn't matter either. So it, you could order it whatever you want. And item potent, which is probably the most important one, you could run over it in multiple passes and it wouldn't matter. Uh, and the best part about that is that this merge operation, even though it seems magical, you, you run it over a set of data that has the duplicates with the stuff that is duplicated on multiple nodes, uh, you get consistency every single time. So here's more of a question for the audience. So I've got, let's say I've got two nodes. And for the sake of simplicity, let's say I've got two sets. Each set has a, a set of ints. Which operator you think would ensure this set of requirements. So if I go here, which one's commutative, which one's associative, and which one's idempotent? It seems really, really complex, but it isn't. Um, in fact, what we found is that, is everybody here familiar with set theory? So it turns out union is all you need. So if you were to run union on every single one of these items and do a union between set A and set A on node one and node two and set B and so on, you get something that looks like this. Um, and just a disclaimer, this in no way is obviously not production code, uh, but conceptually it's all you have to do to maintain that consistency. So I've got uh, two sets with what you have there, and it's I take two hash sets, and I union the items together. I mean, that's it. There's no magic here, because you're taking all the duplicates on one side and the duplicates on the other side and merging them together in a single set. Now, I understand that as developers, we work with very, very complex uh, business domains, and you're never, if you're lucky, unless you're a mathematician, you're never gonna really be working with just ints. But it turns out that this principle also applies to um, hash codes, and we'll get to that. So the other thing I mentioned before is, since we don't delete anything, we don't have to do any kind of tr tracking uh, as to what's been deleted. So. In terms of working with sets, we only have one set to work with, so we start collecting events uh, and then across multiple nodes, and then we just do a read across those nodes and then merge them in all at the same time using the same union operator. So now that we've talked about the theory, uh, you're probably wondering how, does, how do we actually store this stuff? Because when I first started, I thought we could have done this in uh, SQL Server or something like Postgres. Uh, what, how did we actually go about doing this? So one of the things that you'll notice here is that this looks exactly the same as the other slides. The only difference is that I just pasted two different data sources. Now, I recommend using two different types of data sources because you don't, not only do you want to not store your eggs in one basket, but you don't want to store your eggs in the same type of basket. So what we did was, as events were streaming in, we would store one copy in Elasticsearch and another copy in S3. The reason why we wanted to store our events into S3 was we wanted to do long-term storage. But at the same time, we also wanted to store things into Elasticsearch because if somebody had a question about all the events that came in during that day, 
we could quickly search it with Elasticsearch because that's what it's good at. Uh, the other question I mentioned before is, you know, what it, how do you deal with a situation where it might be more than just an or just a number? Uh, as it turns out, uh, it's not that different. So here's a sample clickstream event. And what we do is we take all the properties that you see here and put together one string that is concatenated. And based on that content of that string, we generate a unique hash code with a hashing algorithm. You could use SHA-1 or anything that is relatively unique. So for us, practically anything above 128-bit uh, key space is good enough. So we would take all the properties, union them into or not union, but we merge them into one string, and that hash code would be the equivalent of your int. Because when you're dealing with set theory, it doesn't matter whether it's an int or not, provided that you could guarantee that it's unique. In this case, it's going to be a unique string within a space of 128-bit. Um, now, if we were to pull back a little bit further, Things get a bit more complicated when, you're st when you start working with more than one actor system. Our clickstream pipeline looks like this. So on one side, we've got one clickstream event flowing into our uh, web servers here. The web servers would make copies of the events and send them off to ACA.net. Now, what's not on the slide is that all of our actor systems are talking to each other, not, di not directly not directly, but through SQS. Uh, everything is done either through SQS or just standard HTTP. Now, if you look at the ACA.NET docs, you'll see that they focus a lot on clustering and remoting. But in practice, that's very hard to do within AWS. And you're probably wondering why. Uh, well, when we started doing it, I was quite excited to say, hey, I want to do clustering, because this seems pretty cool to have all these systems talking to each other. But in practice, you, the only way to fix it when things go wrong is to RDP in. And if you know how hard it is to RDP in into a production box or an environment where production boxes go up and down, we need something a bit more robust. We need to be able to send our actor systems out to remote machines and not have to worry about uh, whether things fail or not. So, in this flow of information that you see here, we've got click stream events flowing all the way to S3 and Elastic. But you're probably wondering, well, that's great. I'm sending it in two different directions. But how do you merge what's going on so that we get consistency between S3 and Elasticsearch? So what we ended up doing is we had another actor system that would watch all the events that would come in on both sides. We keep an inventory of all the hash codes that would come in, and we swap any events that are missing from one side to the other. And in practice, this works pretty well, because since we have an eventually consistent system, we could wait until the end of the day, fill in the blanks, and then recompute, and then we hit consistency. Uh, most of the complexity, in fact, has that we run into has been around this type of communication because if we were to use any kind of clustering, if any like more than sixty percent of the nodes were to fall out, we would have a system that is completely unstable. In our case, we found a way to s scale up by having actor systems talk to queues rather than talking to directly to each other, so we could add ten more machines and take them out without actually causing any outages. Now, has everybody here worked with ACA or uh, any actor system to some extent? So there's a few of you here. But I'll explain to you what actor systems actually are. So with an actor system, you could think of it as a lightweight thread. Uh, I would even say an actor system is almost a degenerate operating system. Because an actor is almost like a class, and you could have thousands of them running in memory at once. And they have this concept of a mailbox. So actors could talk to each other and send messages to each other. Um, what happens is that there's a dispatcher that would just do, uh, be in a massive for loop and switch context between every single one of the actors. 
The other thing to remember is that when these actors send messages to each other, they're all immutable. So the power in actor systems is the ability to switch between these actors very quickly without having to worry about consistency. In fact, they're so thread safe that you don't even have to put locks inside of a single actor. As long as it's not some sort of static method that you share with other instances, you could pretty much assume that everything that runs inside of an actor is, uh, has no problems with um, threads at all. If you look at the code, it's actually quite simple as well. So in ACA.net, we've got, this is the, your simple hello world actor. I've got the greeting actor. You, here's the constructor. And in ACA.net, it has a strongly typed receive message, which is the equivalent of an if statement in ACA.net so that says, if you receive a, a message of this type, uh, do something with it. The message itself is fairly straightforward. There's nothing magical here. It's just completely immutable. And the reason why you want to make it completely immutable is it's easy. You don't have to worry about threading or whatnot. And it also makes it easy for ACA.NET to serialize it if you decide to use remoting or clustering. Now, putting together act the actor system itself is equally just as simple. There's a bit more configuration in ACA.NET. But in the simplest case, uh, the actor system you just created in one call. There's a bit of weird syntax here. You can see here we're, we're creating the greet actor. And it takes a while to get used to. But there's a few options there, the more advanced options, where you can create multiple actors and have it scale up automatically. But in, in this case, this is, this is the simplest possible thing you could do to create one actor. Uh, the most important method that you see here is going to be the tell method. Every single app actor has this concept where you could send it a message. You can call tell. And it'll pass it that message. And it's basically this large switch statement that you saw up here. And eventually, when I tell it with a greeting, it'll just get to this point and say, if this, is, this type is a greeting type, then call this method. Now, the other thing you might be asking, is this running on a separate thread? I don't know. I don't care. Uh, it could be running on the same thread. But for the most part, the actor system in ACA.NET abstracts away this idea of trying to do any kind of synchronization. Now, if you looked at the bigger picture here, uh, of course, we're dealing with more than one actor system. So if you look at the ACA.NET docs, they talk about really simple cases like the one I showed you. But in practice, things get a bit messy when you have systems that uh, cross multiple uh, auto scaling groups. And one of the things that we learned is that when you combine ACA.NET and SQS, you have this concept of almost like a distributed swarm. Because the, what we did with SQS is that we have almost like a blind dispatch. I could drop a job request into an SQS queue. And as long as I had a cluster of, say, 10 nodes that would continually pull from that queue, they would just pull it right off of that queue and keep processing. Uh, that sounds great in practice, but there were even cases where we were almost took down AWS, uh, at least the Sydney region, because we didn't throttle it. Um, you, you definitely don't want to be in this kind of situation where you get a nice phone call from AWS saying, please don't do that. So in hindsight, one of the cooler things that we actually did was we introduced this concept of self-throttling actors. So if you look at this, this is actually a live message from Slack. Uh, on for domain Slack. And there's three messages here. The interesting bit is that we actually have actors that scale themselves back or make what they do is they make themselves go faster or slower depending on how much memory they use. So in the first line, you could see there that we do have thresholds. So the low threshold is 1.5 gigs. The other one is 2.5. And the high is 5.1. And the idea here is that we have these actor systems that are completely disconnected from each other, but they scale up and they scale down depending on how much memory is actually being used on the box. So we could have 10 actor systems that are connected to an SQS queue. And as long as they don't all throw out, out of memory exceptions, it's, it's almost like a swarm that regulates itself. 
The interesting part about this is that if you wanted to do this at home, it's actually quite simple. Uh, I could walk you through the code here and you could see that, if I could get my mouse back, here we go. Um, it's actually quite simple. So don't mind this one. I've got constant expressions that are just convert your byte values into um, gigabytes and megabytes and so on. That's just for syntactic sugar. Uh, the important thing, at least conceptually here, is that, and let me zoom in. The important thing here is that ACA.NET has this concept of a scheduler where you could send the same message over a period of time and you could send it over and over and over again. In this case, what I'm doing is I have this empty class here called check memory usage that I send. Uh, I also have a message here for uh, the memory usage metric. So I have the val, so it's, it's quite simple. I could abstract this way into an iMetric interface if I want to. But the idea here is I, I just want to be able to record the number of bytes this actor system is actually using on a given system. At the same time, I want to keep track of the date sample. So if, if, I, if I start collecting these metrics, I want to drop off a certain set of events that have gone beyond, beyond a particular time window. So here's how the message polling actor actually looks. So it's quite simple. In the constructor, I've got the time span. In this case, it defaults to one second. When it receives that check memory usage event, it makes a call out to this method that you can see here which is just a process call. Uh, at the same time, I'm pushing it to the event stream. So if you're not familiar with the event stream in ACA, it's basically a, a bus that exists on, ACA, on an ACA.NET actor system. It doesn't, it's, in some cases it is distributed, but let's assume in this case that it's only for the machine itself so you don't have to worry about uh, subscribers and publishers and whatnot. So the idea here is that on the pre-start method, which is called before the actor system actually starts, it'll tell itself a message to check the memory, and it'll keep sending out these messages onto the bus. Uh, I also have an alarm actor, which is a hypothetical alarm actor that checks for these types of memory messages. And what it does is that if you were to do this in production, you would just watch for this type of message, and you probably want to average it out, but in this case, I simplified it so that I have a threshold that's defined in the constructor. So I've got the high value, medium, and low value. I can keep sending out this message of what memory I'm actually using, and as you can see here, I put the to-do blocks because you could probably do something better than this, uh, where if it goes below the low value, you might want to have it speed up. If it's the medium value, then that's when you want to hit normal speed. So as you can see here, in a couple of instances, we had the high value and the medium value. And I think this one is the low value. But let's just say that if it went to the high value, you can just tell it to either stop polling until the memory drops to a certain level. And then once it switches back up to the medium value, then that's when you could start processing it again. The nice part about this approach is that in just a few lines of code, you could just check and make, as long as you control what's going into the system and you tell the whole system to slow down, then you could pretty much get any actor system to scale up or scale down and you don't have to do any kind of special clustering. This is as simple as it can get. So the rest of the stuff is around boilerplate code. But for the sake of completeness, I'll just go through it. So we've got the memory actor that I created here with a time span of one. Um, originally, this was a printer actor that would just go ahead and uh, print stuff. But let's just assume that in this case, it's just the alarm actor. And there's the syntactic sugar here. So I set the uh, high threshold. If the memory goes over five gigs, then slow down. The normal running memory usage is around two gigs, and anything less than one gig is, uh, is, is just fine and tell to speed up. As you can see, there's nothing magical about this. If I just run this, uh, it's, let's see. Anyway, build time takes forever, but I need to, hold on. So the build time takes forever, but in this case, it's fairly straightforward because as you can see, when it runs, 
you probably want to go ahead and take the average over a few seconds. And then once it hits over a certain threshold, that's when you would change state. But as you can see, there's, it's pretty simple. Uh, and later on, I'll talk about how you could get over the memory limitation, because it turns out there's a memory limitation uh, in console apps, where if you can't go over, I think it's two gigs. But one of the things that we ran into very quickly was that uh, we needed way more than two gigs. In some cases, we needed 14, 16 gigs on one box. So I'll get to that in a second. But so n now that we've talked about the theory with eventual consistency, we've talked about storage. The question here, here is, I did mention before, what about that case where we had that outage in June of, I think it was last year or the year before that, how do you recover from that? And we had this process we called reconciliation. So we would collect everything into S3, and we collect duplicates. But since we had a list of hash codes, it was easy to figure out what was missing in the set. So we could look into S3, figure out what's missing. We could look into Elasticsearch and figure out what's missing. We could have even put together a Merkle tree and said, I've got this set of hash codes on one side, and I've got this other set of hash codes on the other side. Let's just swap events until we're both consistent. The best part about this is that we did this every day. So we had an end of day batch request. And when things went really, really bad, we could just go back into what we saved into S3, pull it out again, and then replay it, and, and we're in a state of consistency. It took a couple of days, but the best part about this approach, even though duplication itself sounds a bit weird if you're coming from a relational background, this did save us. Again, I have to stress this. There's nothing magical about what I've talked about. This is just union. Um, you could take any two sources as long as you can guarantee you have an inventory on both sides and do a union on what's missing, then you can recover very quickly. So now, there's a lot of things that we learned out of this process. Uh, certainly, we made a lot of mistakes along the way. I mean, it's, if this were a computer science thing, I probably would have flunked 10 times in terms of how we did this. But well, the first thing that I've been saying all along is, number one, if you duplicate everything and you've got the right merge algorithm, it doesn't matter uh, what, what you do, in fact, because you get the consistency that you want. So in this case, we have a Slack message where the reconciliation process says, I notice that this amount of events is missing in S3. The other, on the other side, I miss, notice that there's 20,000 events that are missing from Elastic, and that's where we swap. The other bit that is pretty self-evident in this case is that if you want to do strong eventual consistency, but you don't want to de delve deep too much in the theory, it's basically just hash sets and data duplication. You combine those two principles, and you get your consistency. And order doesn't matter. I also mentioned before that you, since we reduce everything into hash codes, uh, timestamps don't matter either. Uh, although timestamps do make sense in recording it in your events, uh, it, it's not really a factor in resolving conflicts. In this case, we don't get conflicts. You just do a union and everything is fixed. The other thing to take away from this one is that since we use SQSQs in between every single actor system that we have, any outage only results in one queue starting to fill up. We don't have any offline uh, we don't have any like online outages where people say, well, my reports aren't working. We do get a bit of delay because of the system itself is eventually consistent. And there's more than a few times where things have fallen behind. But the best part about that is that when we're working in a business that exp expects things within a span of a day, it's OK to fall be behind for a couple of hours while we fix stuff. So. Just a disclaimer, this is not real time in the sense that you, we would be trading stocks with it. But for day-to-day -day line of businesses, this, this was 
good enough, actually. We made a couple million bucks out of this, so I was quite happy. Um, the, uh, oh, and the other thing I just want to point out is, is everybody familiar with the setting? So for those of you who are not familiar with this app config setting, if you have a 64-bit app and say you wanted to create a 10 gigabyte array, uh, it'll throw an out of memory exception unless you had the setting on. We learned this very, very quickly because when we started queuing up messages that would stream in at once, uh, we get out of memory exceptions and we needed more than two or three gigs. It, it just seemed useless to have this uh, C3 double X larger or quad X large instance with eight to 16 gigs of memory and we're capped at two gigs. So make sure when you get into this, you, uh, you turn the setting on. Uh, the last bit is if anybody has, what, wants to get into ACA.net, uh, there's quite a few examples here. Uh, so the memory throttling demo that I, I posted here, you can get it here. Um, the Hello World ACA.net demo is not so important because the ACA.net does have those examples. Uh, but in practice, a lot of there's a few things that we didn't do, like no, we didn't do clustering, we didn't do remoting, simply because in this kind of environment, it doesn't make sense. Uh, the, uh, the last thing I wanted to add in terms of how we did this is that it was pretty much a zero config environment. Uh, we didn't have to do anything like any config files other than the app config and, of course, the AWS keys. For the most part, the actor systems that we put together were basically self-monitoring, self-throttling, and it makes it easy as, as a dev because you don't have to worry about whether it falls over or not. Uh, we added a bit of logging, as you can see, to Slack. We also did some seri log, logging, but overall, it's, it's, it's a different approach, and I hope that you get something out of this. Um, but aside from that, that's pretty much it. Does anybody have any questions? Oh, come on. <laughs> All right, well, thanks for coming to my talk, and just enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>